all to be Smiko Sam Possible Migos. My name is Taffer16. Welcome back to another reaction video. Welcome to my second reaction to Charlie Brooker's Weekly Wipe, and I think probably my last reaction with crappy lighting. Uh, some of you might have noticed, but the last couple reactions on this part, the room has looked uh, less lit, and on the reaction part, my webcam has pulled in more. That's because I have four lights one here, one here, one here, and one over here. And this one over here lights up the whole green screen. Um, you know, to, to you have to have light on the green screen for it to work better. Um, that light blew a couple days ago, and I just got a new one. It's coming tomorrow in the mail. Um, so, yep, this should be the last video of crappy lighting. But let's go ahead and watch uh, Series 1, Episode 2. <laughs> That is such stock music, but I like it. <laughs> Renderforce.com Hello, I'm Charlie Brooker, and you're watching Weekly Wipe, a program all about things that are happening. Things like this. The Tory party has been split over gay marriage. Conservative elders say it flies in the face of the traditional Tory position that marriage should be between a philanderer and a doormat. <laughs> Incredible facial reconstruction technique reveals Richard III resembled amateur waxwork of Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen. In distressing scenes, the news captured a knife-wielding man being tasered oh, wow. outside Buckingham Ooh. Palace. The only man more shocked than him was eyewitness Ian Hislop. And then one cop went behind him and, and tased him. He fell on the ground <laughs> within a couple of seconds. And he got taken away in the uh, police van. I can't. I can't and Edward D. Again. Eagle Edwards wins oh, no. the Celebrity Dunking Festival Splash. Wow. He fought off tough competition from Linda Barker's revealing plunge and Jake Benidorm's amazing oh. twitching tits. Eagle's victory proves once and for all that even our fittest celebrities are no match for our shittest Olympian. <laughs> that's precisely the sort of thing that's been going on, but we start here. For many years, numbers were our friends, appearing on the shirts of national heroes, making us laugh on calculators, and starring in cheerful and hypnotic animations aimed at babies. Oh, God. Five, two, seven, eight, nine, but it turns out this was a front, and now we know the ugly truth. Numbers may look jolly, but in reality, they're bastards. Yeah. Recently, the Office of National Statistics proved they are by releasing a set of grim economic numbers. Gross domestic product fell by 0.3% in the fourth quarter of 2012. So grim, they effectively silenced every journalist in the room. Any more questions? There must be some. There must be some. Numbers <laughs> have now knackered the country so comprehensively, the only businesses doing a roaring there trade are shutter some. manufacturers, window board salesmen, and sad graph designers. In fact, the sad graph industry is booming. There are basic graphs, nostalgic graphs, and graphs with the sort of interactive chancellor head on them for you to fire light guns at. If you can afford a light gun, which you can't, thanks to him. Everything costs more these days. Petrol's so expensive you'd think it was some kind of precious resource mined dangerously from the sea, and the prices are always rising. They go up quick enough, but they never ever come down. Well, if they do, yeah, a month later. Yeah, never, ever, or a month later. They're yeah. not even consistent in never coming back down. That's what devious shits these prices are. But numbers don't really convey the human cost, which is why reporters are keen to hear tales of personal, number-induced misery. Newsnight rounded up plenty of totally representative people to find out what they think. Does it feel like we're in a double <laughs> or triple dip recession? It does, yeah. Do you think things will pick up? And what about you? I've had the same really. There's just no spare money anywhere. Um, every bit of money you get goes on bills, electric. Elephant on suits. And what do you do? Um, I'm a builder by trade. Indian or African builder? In an attempt to convey the misery of the number catastrophe, yeah, awesome. Sky invited a range of small business folk on air to share their tragic experiences. Well, one of the stories behind the numbers situation is keenly felt by businesses up and down the country. Oh, good, this will be sad. Tell us a little bit briefly about your, your business and how it's coping right now. We're coping pretty well. We're on the high street and the internet, and uh, we're doing pretty well, yeah. actually. Oh, shit, sorry, they must have asked you by mistake. Try someone else. Tell us a bit about your business and how you're faring right now. Actually, last year, yeah, we probably had one of the best years we've ever had. Yeah, but apart from that, how bad is it? Out of the last six months of the year, five months of those were best ever months. 
All right, show off. Let's ask the other um, bloke. Um, I would concur with the previous comments. We've actually seen a big <laughs> upturn in 2012, and and our revenues were were increased. Oh, for f sake. Okay, try interviewing a sort of hotelier restaurateur type who looks a bit like a prototype David Mitchell. David, welcome to you. Uh, How's business? It's been amazingly good, actually. Oh, everyone's a winner, aren't they? <laughs> Tell us more. We're doing very well. Growth last year uh, on the bedroom element. Growth on the bedroom element? You do realise Embarrassing Bodies is next door. Yes, there's no denying it's been tough on the high street recently, which is why it's curious that against this backdrop of high street shoppy side, ITV have decided to offer viewers some outlandish escapism with a series set in a fantasy world where people actually open shops. Mr Selfridge is effectively Downton Abbey with a stockroom, shot in HD and given a thick layer of creosote. It tells the slightly embellished story of Mr Harry Selfridge, a born showman and irritant who somehow managed to create one of London's foremost department stores, despite consisting of hardly anything but a beard and some teeth. I don't know why they chose Harry Selfridge over Bob Comet or Dick Debenhams, but presumably Selfridge's The Shop is delighted because it gets name-checked every other nanosecond. Mr Selfridge. Mr Selfridge. Yes, Mr Selfridge. Oh, boy. The Selfridgean exterior has been faithfully reproduced, presumably with CGI and some string, although most of the interior action is confined to one floor, which the cast perpetually stride through in a transparent bid to make discussion of stock levels seem dramatic. Still, we might only ever see one floor, but Selfridges does clearly have a massive cheese department in the form of Jeremy Piven. <laughs> this Mr Selfridge is no mere Barrow boy, well, more of a Barrow them. man, specifically John Barrow man. We need to put on a show. Oh my he God. He performs the role with all the subtlety of a pantomime dame desperately trying to attract attention from the window of a burning building. Equally unsubtle is some of the dialogue, such as this exchange between Mr Selfridge and a good as gold plebby shop girl he's taken under his wing. You love it, don't you? The customers, the selling, the feeling of merchandise underneath your hands. I love it more than anything. It's hard to tell the other shop I need girls to watch apart, this. partly because they're always either whispering or tittering in the corner like church mice in a Disney cartoon, I need to and watch partly this. because they're styled like they've gone to a fancy dress wake as a cottage loaf. Everywhere you look, it's Princess Anne in mourning. Seriously, sometimes there are so many Princess Anne's on screen at once, even they can't tell if they're looking in a mirror. <laughs> but the main problem is that because it's based on a real shop opened by a real man, there's not much real jeopardy. So the opening episode was a nail-biting tale of will he or won't he open the shop when you know he did. Then we had will he or won't he open a perfume counter, which you also know he did. And recently we had is he or isn't he dead when you know he won't be. It's a bit like a whodunit called Colin is guilty. Still, while Mr Selfridge ingests scenery on ITV, the BBC is shoving viewers' faces headfirst into the grisly world of Ripper Street, what? a sort of CSI Whitechapel with nods to Sherlock and Deadwood set in Victorian London, a time when yeah. men were men except when they looked a bit like owls. It stars Matthew McFadden as a sad-eyed proto-copper struggling with personal grief and a silly hat. Jerome off Robson and Jerome looking a bit like a ship's figurehead that's been smashed repeatedly into a dock. And an American as a sort of pathologist come corpse connoisseur who examines the bodies in the manner of an expert on Antiques Roadshow. You see this wound-like impression in the clavicle? Her fingers... Wound-like impression? Worn and puckered by strings. And her hair... There are heavy deposits in it. What? Soot. And without oh. that soot damage, she would have been worth as much as £3,000. Seriously, loads of people die in this. It's like Victorians had the life expectancy of a cocoa pop. And since it comes off the back of Call the Midwife, it's as if BBC One has decided Sunday night is women screaming helplessly night. <laughs> oh, Call the Midwife was brilliant. It was this drama thing about these sort of schoolgirls who worked for these mad nuns about 100 years ago. And their job was to go into poor people's houses and do these exorcisms on pregnant women. It's exciting because you see them pulling babies out of women and meeting all these really horrible men. Send it to her and I'll say to you, you clear out of my home or I'll burn her and I'll burn her again. That's enough! <laughs> Those bits are sad, but then they meet all these really nice babies, which is happy. The babies are really good actors. Oh, there we go. <laughs> God knows how they read the scripts. They must have had to stick it on a mobile for them or something and then wait ages for it to spin round for the right bit for the baby to learn what to do, like, oh, I've got to lift my arm up at that point, you know, and all that. People have said it's rose-tinted, but it isn't. It's sort of green. And sometimes it's really green. And then like green. sometimes it's brown. And sometimes it's sort of green and brown, but it isn't pink because it's on early, so they can't show those bits. 
<laughs> Good old fashioned <laughs> British televised healthcare there, but what's American televised healthcare like? Uh, Let's ask an American, namely drunk comic, Doug Stanhope. Oh boy. I'm Doug Stanhope, and that's why I drink. <laughs> As I'm sure you're aware, we don't have a national health service here in no. America like you do. We either have to pay for it or we have to suck it up. Fucking UK, they have nationalized health care. We have uh, 300 channels of cable and TV doctors. You have to get the best you can do. Yeah, we're chock full of TV doctors, doling out all the free advice you're willing to swallow. Have you heard of Dr. Phil? He's an Oprah Winfrey protege. The other yeah. day, we saw he had a 800 pound guy that had made a YouTube video of himself. I'm just trying to get some help. Oh, I remember this guy. Personal trainer, Dr. Phil. Please help me, Dr. Phil, because of my can't get out of my bed. So Dr. Phil, being a great doctor and all, he sends an <laughs> ambulance directly to this poor fat prick's house and they tow his bed into an oversized <laughs> industrial ambulance and they drive him directly to the studios. As any medical professional would do. Do you really believe that you can have a normal life and a normal body and a normal health? Yeah. When they run out of obvious <laughs> advice, like uh, plug up your top hole, fatty, you're eating too much, then they have to move into junk science. Now we just start inventing diseases. What, you're a hoarder? Oh, wait, that's not a habit. That I is used a to watch obsessive this show. compulsive disorder. And we have an expert here that can help you with it if you allow them to exploit you on TV for an hour. I watch hoarders and I see shit I need. <laughs> <laughs> then we have the cottage industry of rehab television. You mm. have Dr. Drew, and you have Addicted, and you have Cracking Addiction. Intervention is my favorite. Intervention mm. is a show that's 58 minutes long yeah. of complete exploitation. It's just watching some poor prick stumble through his life and get fired from his job, and he's shooting up in a bus toilet, and now mm. he's puking in a trash can and shitting his pants. Yeah, I've seen this. That's the first 55 minutes, and then they cut to the intervention and that's just the sad family sitting around reading these sappy letters that they wrote like hallmark greeting cards this is the ways you've ruined my life bruce you didn't show up for sheila's bar mitzvah Wah. and then they whisk them off to rehab where you go okay now this is where well, like it's Bicker, helpful we're gonna, it's gonna show us how they rehabilitate these people nope that's the end of the show graphic at the end Bruce hasn't drank since July 21st 2009 well what you do in the rehab if you're trying to help people you might want to tell us what the fucking cure is you skipped over that part entirely <laughs> I'm just saying that if you're going to get your medical advice from a TV doctor, you might as well just get the advice from Dr. Dre or Dr. Seuss. Because <laughs> at least that way the bad advice you get will rhyme. That's, that's a good point. Transport, and as the news excitedly showed, Prince Charles celebrates 150 years of cramped subterranean hell by using the London Underground. As far as Charles is concerned, an oyster card is a credit card someone else uses to buy you oysters. So little wonder he approached it all like a virgin. Uh, here's how you do it. Uh, push your thingy up against the little round nubbin, and you'll put the flaps open. There you go. And ease yourself in all the way. good -o. Not that it was his first time. As ITN nostalgically explained, the last time Charles used the Underground was during a pledge spotting trip in 1979, whereas the last time Camilla braved the tube was their wedding night. They didn't go all the way. In fact, Charles only lasted two minutes before popping off. Well, it's understandable, really. Poor bloke hasn't been inside a tunnel for 34 years. Oh. <laughs> Jesus. Technology and the humble Blackberries had it hard of late with tough competition and tech problems denting its popularity to the point where, as Sky News forensically pointed out, its own users tried to kill it with hammers. <laughs> it took about a month of intermittent bashing <laughs> to actually break the Blackberry handset up. But now the Blackberry handset folk were attempting to revive their fortunes with an informative and exciting relaunch. Yes, they're replacing their outmoded pocket typewriters with something that looks like an iPhone but isn't, and another thing that looks like a Blackberry and is. Aren't they beautiful? But perhaps most startling of all, BlackBerry now has a new global creative director. 
courtesy of an announcement straight out of the Celebrity Apprentice. She's BlackBerry's new global creative director. Please welcome Mrs. Alicia Keys. Yes, Alicia Keys. Keys. They signed her because playing the piano and wearing hats are key business skills. And That's not because random. the CEO wanted an excuse to get off with her on stage. What's odd about the appointment of Alicia Keys is she's actually a big Apple fan. I mean, she did a whole song about New York. In fact, the only thing Alicia Keys has to do with Blackberry is she's black and wears a beret. <laughs> and you wonder if she's ever really going to work. I'll Wonderful. see you in the office. Yeah, All Monday, right. Thank o'clock. you. <laughs> but Ms Keys wasn't the only MOBO winner hawking oh, technology. God. The ubiquitous Will I Am was at Macworld last week where the Wall Street Journal asked him penetrating questions about technology. What's your, what's your favourite gadget right now? Right now would be the iPad Mini. Really? What do you like about it? It's smaller than the iPad. He was promoting his own bespoke gizmo, showcased lovingly by CNN, a $400 accessory that turns the iPhone into a boxier, less ergonomic iPhone. So then you sit there and you lock it. Now it's locked. <laughs> Presumably it's aimed at people who wished they'd bought a camera in 1978 instead of an iPhone in 2013. <laughs> but wait, it also has an extra function. Well, if that's not enough, a keypad for folks who want to text. Yeah, for folks who want to text on something other than, but attached to, the iPhone they already own. Still on the plus side, it lights up. Will I am is proud of his invention, as he explained during the launch a few months ago. This was in my head in February, and now it's in my hand in November. About to be in stores in December. And in landfill sites by March. Yeah. <laughs> who paid attention to Marley last year? Well, hardly anyone, myself included. There was no connection between Marley and me. I thought it was a film about a dog. Yeah. In fact, the only people who seemed to care about Marley were the French and the widely derided presidential candidate Mitt Romney, who mentioned mm. the country in his third debate. We want to make sure that we're seeing progress throughout the Middle East, with Mali now having North Mali taken over by Al-Qaeda. Only to get laughed at. As the depressing subsequent coverage made clear, life in northern Mali was grim. Islamic extremists had gained a foothold there and were apparently making civilian life about as much fun as sitting through nine episodes of Paddy's TV Guide, with regular public thrashings for minor infractions. Mm. Unsurprisingly, the locals moved out in an evacuation, or exodus. Well, that's what? Mali for you. The Malian army tried fighting back, but they seemed underprepared. As a startling French news report revealed, they were genuinely having to train without ammunition. Someone answer that gun. They weren't the best <laughs> equipped army in the world. Their uniforms were threadbare and their weapons were jamming. God damn it. Well, that's Marley for you. By contrast, as Sky News comprehensively showed, the extremists seemed heavily armed with weapons apparently gained during the Libyan uprising. In oh. fact, they had so many guns, they often seemed to just frolic about with them, like men playing with puppies. God France damn. responded by sending in troops who took the fight all over northern Mali. They also sprayed paratroopers over Timbuktu in what looked suspiciously like footage from 1943. It does, yeah. The onslaught surprised both the Islamists and people like me who thought Timbuktu was a made-up region of Narnia or something. <laughs> As the Islamists fled, Sky News broadcast footage of the jubilant locals recorded for posterity on a Commodore VIC-20. <laughs> the people of Timbuktu were so delighted to be liberated by the French, they dressed up in celebratory costume for Sky's cameras, briefly turning Alex Crawford into Gok Wan. Look what this man has done. He's done the uh, Viva l'Operation Cervelle. That's the, the, the name of the operation that uh, Francois Hollande has given it. And then not the back a big thank you to not only to the French president Hollande but all the other countries who've helped support this operation that's quite a get up, get up, stand up. damn well, it that's Marley for you while the scenes of celebration were genuine enough, what wasn't quite clear was who the routed extremists actually were. Whoever they were, there wasn't much footage of them, mainly just the chaos left in their wake, such as burnt-out cars and a strange emphasis on the book collections they'd destroyed. Do you know why libraries annoy Islamic extremists so much? Maybe they think the Jewy system was invented by Jews. While Them Malians were suffering, the rest of the world wasn't too bothered until a few weeks ago when yet another terrorist group crept out of Mali into Algeria and overran a BP complex taking hostages. This was a terrifying event and a huge news story, but frustratingly for the networks, there was a distinct lack of footage of it, forcing them to improvise. Hence, we saw a lot of Google map explainers and reconstructions of the event that made it all look a bit like an Xbox Half-Life mod. <laughs> 
Still, at least the news had something new to scare us with, namely terrorist leader Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar. So bad they named him twice. Actually, he's got a variety of aliases. Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar has an entourage that calls him the Prince. They also call him One-Eyed Jack, as in the Jack of Diamonds. AKA One-Eye, because he lost an eye, AKA the Marlboro Man, because he man. made a living smuggling cigarettes. Yeah, AKA that bloke we've only got the one shot of. Yeah. In fact, they had so little underwhelming footage of Bel Mokhtar, they had to keep fiddling with it just so it looked sinister. Freezing it, zooming in and out, turning him into a sort of Warhol screen print, and on Sky, superimposing silly spook-style graphics over him while playing an ominous chord. Bel Mokhtar has joined the A-list of world's most wanted men. And to be fair, anyone looks sinister if you do that to them. I mean, True. look at Nicholas Lindhurst here. <laughs> Chilling. <laughs> in a sign the West is now taking the threat seriously, David Cameron committed troops to Mali, then hopped on a plane for a whistle-stop holiday tour of the troubled yet beautiful region where he enjoyed the scenery, shuffled past traditionally dressed locals, marvelled at their detailed miniature leaders and fine array of meze, and generally did his best to blend in with his surroundings. <laughs> in summary, the situation in North Africa, and Mali in particular, is clearly one to keep an eye on. That's Marley. Yeah, I get it. David Cameron's tour of North Africa provoked much thoughtful reaction, some of it online. Here's our regular roundup of some of the sort of things you've been saying online. Yes, you, your words, your opinions. It's what you think. Oh. It's points off of you in points off you. Okay. Seeing Cameron play the international statesman seemed to annoy some of you. For instance, Alan from Leicester uh, logged on to say simply, go on, Dave, you toilet house. <laughs> Robust yet concise commentary from Alan there. Cameron also visited Libya as part of his travels. You toilet didn't house. impress pooped on worker, who took to Yahoo to say, he's <laughs> going to help them as well, and our bloody council tax will rise. Why are we standing for this? Pooped on worker seems to have calmed down there slightly at the end. Yeah. Maybe you were just tired. Tired after another long day being pooped on as part of the system. <laughs> aren't we all? Someone calling themselves European, which scarcely narrows it down, complains <laughs> that Dave is spending our money on Muslims, the very people that hate us. Well, actually, Jeez. much of that money is going to be spent on shooting Muslims. Beyonce was in the news again. First, she admitted lip syncing at Obama's inauguration during a tense press conference. Then she blew Damn the roof Beyonce. off the Super Bowl with a triumphant performance that had millions pumping their fists, some of them in their laps. But not everyone's happy That's with it. No. Samantha went to the Mail Online to say, Beyonce, if you're so proud of your daughter, let us see her face. So what if she looks like her dad? You chose to have a baby with an unattractive man. Are you waiting until she's old enough for plastic surgery? Then you will let her see her? And what sort of complex are you giving to this poor child? You know what, Samantha? We have seen her baby's face. There was a widely distributed heartwarming photo of it. Look, see? There it is. Anyway, thank you, Samantha. Good luck battling the demented sense of righteous entitlement, which seems to have hopelessly crippled your sense of reason. Yeah. All this kerfuffle over Beyonce's <laughs> baby prompted someone calling themselves Blatalian. Blatalian? Blatalian? To take to Twitter to point out that bitches be more concerned with <laughs> Beyonce's baby than theirs. Oh, got him. Yes, em. well, that is one thing we can all agree on. And now, here's something else. Hitchcock is a shaggy mm. dog story involving everyone's favourite borderline misogynist cinematic genius Alfred Hitchcock, played by Anthony Hopkins in a slightly distracting fat suit, which makes him vaguely look like he's in a highbrow all-white Big Mama's House spin-off. You can the really story tell. concerns Hitch's attempts to shoot his stabby meisterwork psycho while experiencing relationship turbulence with wife Alma, played by Helen Mirren, and suffering troubling visions of real-life serial killer Ed Gein, whose genuine corpse-skinning exploits oh. were the inspiration for Psycho. Graphic elements of brutal violence transvestites and incest. Sounds ghastly. Peggy, this is the boy who dug up his own mother. It starts off well, and the behind-the-scenes on Psycho stuff is initially fascinating, for film spots at any rate. But the film soon veers into clunky terrain and winds up feeling like an underwhelming TV movie about a kooky couple, which leaves you chiefly frustrated that a bunch of fine performances have been left wandering fruitlessly in search of a slightly better yeah. script. It has great moments, but not quite enough of them. But nor is it a complete horror show, which is ironic, really, given the subject matter, which is filming Janet Lee being stabbed to death in the shower.
Joining me to discuss that and topics of rising hey. are journalist Camilla Long and comedian Bob <laughs> Mortimer, who once stabbed a woman to death in the shower. Isn't that right? That's correct, yes. <laughs> I've often wondered, if you were stabbing someone to death in a shower, where would you start? They say the classic prison um, stabbing is in the arse. No, I think they've been telling you stories. No, well, because it makes, it makes, it makes the, the point. No, it's very, very difficult to heal. It takes forever and they can't sit down. A lot of them can simply be stitched and the pain goes away. But not the so, bum. Not the arse. No, but, there but is no <laughs> surgeon will stitch an arse. So if Janet Lee had been stabbed in the arse in yeah. Psycho, yeah. she could have survived, but the rest of the film she'd have been really complaining yeah. and not really enjoying yes, that money she'd Yes, I think we would have had a movie. With. It would be a different movie that if she'd be. been stabbed in the bum. Would you say you're a Hitchcock fan? Um, I enjoyed the films when I was young. You know, when I was 13, 14, when they first came out. But I think that... What are you uh, saying? You're now too sophisticated for Hitchcock. Well, I think that technology has um, made them seem very dated and difficult to enjoy for me. Mm. I don't know why there's such reverence for Psycho. I can't, I can't quite see it. So you prefer new stuff to I'm mu I'm much in, the, in that genre, yeah, I much prefer it. Like but I understand. Some of the Spanish stuff like Wreck and Juliet's mm. Eyes. And that stuff, Wreck is a terrifying they're, film. They're terrifying. They're magnificent. You're a real connoisseur of these things, basically. <laughs> well, I've, se I've been about a bit. I'm 50. <laughs> I'd like to see Bob's movie with review the first channel. Rush of DVD rentals. I don't. Would you remember that? Joe? You remember? came with the first rush of DVD. <laughs> <laughs> right. You really are a that fan. Very of moment. The yeah. blockbusters open. Psycho did kickstart the slasher movie genre. There's a new slasher film coming out in March. It's called Maniac. Uh, it's got a gimmick, which is that it's all shot from the point of view of the killer. Oh, I haven't seen this. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Who do you think is playing the killer in that? Christian Slater? No. Uh, Mr. Paparazzi? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Darren Lyons. Yeah. <laughs> the Isn't guy who looks like a sort of depressed Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh my yeah. God. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Paparazzi, I could believe, kills women. I definitely could. <laughs> um, it's Elijah Wood. Oh! Elijah Wood, Frodo Baggins <laughs> from Lord of the Rings. The only way his face would look disturbing is if you sheared it off, I think, and stuck it on the end of a pike and waved it. Oh, oh I think someone. he's very weird looking. It you know, looks... baby face is good for a killer. Would yes. you go and see that? I would, yeah. I do like horror. I haven't I like heard of it. I go and see horror in the afternoon because the cinema's empty and I can smoke. What, in the suit? Yes. That's... Do you smoke in cinemas? <laughs> when there's no one in, yes. Really? You really? They let you. No, well, I don't ask anyone's Have permission, it's empty. Own. I can't relax in cinemas. I always if think it's empty, that I something guess. terrible is going to happen in a cinema. And I, certainly, if I went into a cinema in the afternoon, there was a lone man sitting in the middle smoking, I'd <laughs> probably leave, I think. I'd definitely think he was a pervert. <laughs> That's a good point. A world of shit for Fluids and the world's favourite chemically complex refreshment beverage unveils an arresting ad telling the everyday story of a simple gardener undermined by a gang of predatory can-rolling women. Of course, if you actually rolled a drinks can at a professional lawnmower, it'd get shredded up by the blades and ragged shards of metal would fly out, slicing his face and throat open. Not that these would care, no. Not as long as his six-pack's intact. And stopping the mower isn't enough for these picnic baskets, no. They then trick him into drinking the shooken up can, causing it to detonate in the messiest cum shot of all time. But our cunning Moman gets his revenge by pulling his soggy top off and silencing the Harridans by flaunting his beveled surfaces at them, thereby rendering them both speechless and wetter than him. And thus, women are conquered once more. I guess the take-home message here is that it's funny to force menial workers to strip and that Diet Coke only contains one calorie and you can soon burn that off with about 10 seconds of bean polishing. Oh, and in the interest of balance, I have to point out other diet drinks are available, e.g. water. <laughs> Publications, and in a series of disturbing ads, tranquil lunch breaks nationwide are repeatedly interrupted by the invasion of a cheerful oak tree. Hiya! Hiya! So, Hiya. what do you think of the stories in this week's Take a Break? I don't know, what do I think of the stories in this week's Take a Break? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, haven't you lot got to go back to work? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, f <laughs> British break. industry. It seems no lunch break is safe from Mel's weekly inspections. Hiya! What do you think of the stories in this week's Take a Break? Well, they're all a bit depressing, to be honest with you. I mean, they're all about death and disease and like... Hiya! Oh. Hiya! <laughs> so, what do you think of the stories in this week's Take a Break? I don't know anymore! Haven't you lot got to go back Yo, to Yoshi's totally going to put this well, in the next video. Work, Mel. I hope Yoshi doesn't like it. <laughs> and a simpering husband dribbles his way through a glossy cheese ball hair dye ad. Kate and I have been married for 15 years. That's three moves, five jobs, two newborns. It's no wonder I'm getting grey. Grey? You're black and white. But Kate <laughs> still looks like... Kate. 
It'd be weird if she looked like the late Richard III. I don't know all her <laughs> secrets, but I do know Kate's more beautiful now than the day I married her. Yeah, well, the day you married her, she was pale and shivering with regret, you fucking creep. <laughs> Well, uh, that's your lot. We're done for now. You and I are through. Till next time, go away. Okay. But again, I'm going away because I want to. Actually, told me. Hey, where are you going? Come back. Oh, God. Okay, no, he's just cleaning. Well, joke's on Charlie because I was just looking at Mr. Selfridge and the reviews are pretty good, actually. So maybe it got better as it went on. Um... And it's, um, it got, uh, it got 40 episodes over four series. It lasted until 2016. So, joke's on Charlie, I guess, because it went for a bit. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, wow, is this correct? It looks like the first episode is, no, this can't be, it says on PBS.com, but the first episode is listed as almost two hours, but. That can't be right. Two hours? I mean, maybe an hour, but I don't know, two hours? Uh, I, I still, you know, I still want to see it now. Now I want to see it for different reasons. Okay, hour six minutes. Okay, that's a little bit different. First episode is an hour six minutes. I probably won't be able to get this on YouTube, but I, I, I'd like to check this out now. So that's what I took from this video today as I found something new to watch. So maybe that can be the purpose of this Charlie Brooker series is finding me new things to watch. That sounds pretty good, actually. I think I'll use it for that. Well, that was it for my second reaction to Charlie Brooker's Weekly Wipe. Thank you guys for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to leave a like. If you didn't like it, don't. If you want to follow any of my social media links, they're all in the video description down below. Thank you to all my patrons for supporting me and my channel as well, who are named in the video description. In addition to your name down there, you also get access to reaction videos, as well as reading your comments up to date early, sometimes more. For that being said, though, my name is Taffer's team. This has been my second reaction to Charlie Brooker's Weekly Wipe, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.